to AJ and Book Review. I'm Lexi Landsman, Deputy Editor of Arts and Lifestyle. With me is Dr Howard Goldenberg. His book raft will be launched at the Melbourne Writers' Festival on August 23. Thanks for joining me, Dr Goldenberg. It's a great pleasure, Lexi. It's an honour. Thank you. So raft is a collection of true stories, many of them quite unnerving and all of them which recount your experiences working as a doctor in Outback Australia and in an Outback prison. So firstly, why did you decide to put pen to paper and record your experiences? Well, all my life I've written about things that move me or disturb me or strike me as significant. I think the act of writing helps me to work out, to work through an experience and to work out what it means to me and certainly these are, as you describe them, they, these are disturbing experiences and profound and sometimes moving but always significant and strange. And, and in over a decade you have made over 50 working visits as a relieving doctor for Aboriginal communities in Outback Australia and you're in, it's those encounters during that period which you write in the book with the doctor's eye for precision and detail, but also the writer's eye for observation and reflection. So when you wrote the book, was there a battle between the physician and you wanting to record events and the writer and you wanting to give them meaning? It's a good question, really. I was going to say there was no battle because I, I'm not really first and foremost a medical scientist. I'm, I think I'm a medical humanist. But, but really, fundamentally, I think there's an unnoticed continuum between the doctor and the writer. The word doctor doesn't even mean healer or physician. It actually means teacher or scholar. Many patients that you treated in the various wards around the Australian outback clearly left an indelible mark on you. One in particular was Sylvia, who was a victim of domestic violence and came to you with a lacerated face. There were many others, like a dehydrated baby whose mother gambled away money for food, and Zachariah, whose infected elbow hadn't healed for five years. So was it an entirely new experience working as a physician in remote communities in Outback Australia? Yes, yes. I, you know, I was trained in, in Melbourne, and, I've, and much of my work's been done in Melbourne, and it, it's a modern city where you practice modern medicine and diseases like rheumatic heart disease are uncommon and are now rare in general practice. In my first fortnight of a locum, I saw more cases in two weeks than I had seen in the previous 20 years of general practice of young people whose hearts were failing because they had suffered rheumatic fever. It, it, is, it is truly and literally in the classical sense, tragic. So in that sense, apart from being a, a sort of memoir, the book sheds light on the reality for many Indigenous Australians living in remote communities. So when you wrote the book, was that your intention? Did you aim to bring to light or bring to public awareness a number of in issues facing that, those communities? I don't think I had any strategy in mind at all beyond expressing myself then, as, I, as that progressed, I thought I'd like to express myself to others. And I think I was, I was communicating my own pain, I think, initially, and then moral disori uh, disorientation. And then the experience of trying to work through that and uh, not imagine myself to be some sort of passive, individual or some sort of uh, collateral victim but, but to try to define some useful role, some sense of redemption and I think there are signs of redemption in, in, in Aboriginal life and, and in Aboriginal health. They are elusive and slender mm. but they're numerous and growing. Mm -hmm. And just going back to something you just said then, you said you were expressing your pain and one of the things that's very evident in the book is it's very descriptive. You're clearly a very keen observer um, of, of humanity and of, and of individuals. 
Was the book for you a form of catharsis in any way? Was it an attempt to, I guess, chronicle your experiences in a, in a meaningful way? I think so. I think probably a writer has only one story deep down. Mm. And it's the story of what that person has lived or seen or dreamed or feared. And those things are all in this book. And the writer has adopted a, a means of expressing rather than repressing those mm. things, mm. which operate painfully or constructively in every human being. And I should just add that I think that they're Jewish experiences. I think that the, the Jewishness of the observer keeps tripping me up mm. as I work and as I write. Mm. I don't expect it. Um, but in so many ways, Aboriginal lives and ideas and values correspond or interse intersect with Jewish ones. Um, and our attachment to land, an experience of humiliation or dispossession, even massacre, um, an attachment to a culture, uh, the, over, uh, the overweening power of family and community. And also I've had the blessing of growing up in the nicest, mm. racist country in the world. I think Australia has, you know, it's, mm. it's taints of racism. Mm. Here we are being, having this conversation in Sydney where, mm. where there's a suburb called Cronulla. Mm. Mm. You know, it's a multi-ethnic, multi-racial country. Mm. I'm richly Australian, mm. Mm. proudly and gratefully, mm. but also conscious that my immense good fortune mm comes at the cost of the dispossession of previous owners. Mm. So I don't know if that's a Jewish sentiment. It's not solely a Jewish sentiment, but it, uh, it's not. It's probably essential to my Jewishness, mm. a feeling that good fortune doesn't come through my deserving it. Mm. Very deserving people have very mm. poor fortune. We know that from our own history. Good fortune comes to you mm. by grace or providence. We need to appreciate it, and when it comes to you at the cost of another, mm. we have a debt. Mm. Mm. So were you very aware of your Jewishness when you were travelling around Australia? I'm more, I think I'm more aware of my, my Jewishness, or aware of it in a more intense and probably heightened way in, in the outback. You know, mm. Wherever you walk on the surface of this earth, where mm. human beings haven't trod too heavily, mm. you have a sense of the glory of creation. Mm. Mm. And people who are not religious at all feel that. Mm. And they talk about a spiritual experience. Mm. And it's uplifting and it's deepening. It's an everyday epiphany in the outback. Mm. Mm. And so I feel, in that isolation from a Jewish community, a freshness and an intensity of living my Jewishness. Mm. It's, it's delightful and it's profound. And, and your first book, My Father's Compass, was a biography of your father's long and extraordinary life. Uh, but it was also a journey through half a century of Jewish history, tradition and culture. So it definitely seems to be um, an exploration of Jewish tradition. It's something that you keep coming back to in your writing inescapably I think. My family came here in 1840 and, um, and I was raised in a little country town by Orthodox parents who raised four Orthodox kids and those are unusual experiences and um, I grew up in a family like Jewish families are, full of books and stories and uh, I grew up as the son of a, an inspiring doctor so those things all played themselves out in my life. And what do you hope that readers will take away from Raft? Um, I hope they'll take away the very clear message that, that there isn't any simple solution. Mm. I hope that some will take away the Talmudic message that uh, ours is not to complete the task, mm. but we're not free to desist from starting it. Mm. Well, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, it really sounds like a phenomenal book that covers a lot of ground. And I wish you all the best for the launch and, and what comes after it.